trees beats wild and tame small creatures birds exalt his name all nations and their kings princes and all who reign young men and maidens too both children Let's join together in prayer. Lord our God, we come to you in praise this evening. We've just been singing of how the whole of creation is summoned to praise you. Hills and trees and animals and the sea and the land and the rivers and the whole of creation because you made it and it reflects your greatness and your splendor, your glory, your majesty. And Lord, we, this evening, as human, your human creatures, would join with them to praise your great name. Lord, you are worthy of our praise, and you are worthy to be glorified, to be served, to be honored that all that we have, by, by all that we have, all that we are. And we pray that you would enable us to give you the praise that is your due, that you are worthy of. And we praise you this evening that, again, as we were singing, that you have given a mighty king, that one has come in the line of David and that he is Jesus Christ, and that he has come to rule this world, that he is this world's true and rightful king who reigns with perfect justice and, and righteousness and we praise you for him we praise you too that he is the king who although he is all powerful and almighty that he has humbled himself and come among us and lived that life of of service lived out for others and even to the extent of laying down that life for his people Lord, we thank you that we have such a king, and we pray that all that we do this, this evening and this weekend, and indeed in all our days, would be towards his honor and glory. We pray that you would be with us this weekend as we remember his death in particular, and that as we remember that that may be a blessing to each of us, that we may remember with deep gratitude and thanksgiving for the king who laid down his life for us. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. You know us, you know our needs, our concerns, our burdens, and we bring these before you. And we pray that you would meet us at our own point of need this evening. We pray for our land at this time, our nation, we commit it to you. We pray for its leaders. We know that there's much uh, uncertainty about the future at the moment for, for Scotland and a degree of upheaval, and we do pray that your hand would be in these things and that you would have mercy on us, that you would provide us with leaders who are wise, who are honest, who uh, have a a desire and a concern to do what is just and, and right, who are compassionate. And 
we pray too, we pray for ourselves as citizens that you would help us to live in our land in a way that, that we use the opportunities, the responsibilities that we have to the full. We know that we have many privileges and we pray that you would help us to live as good citizens and also as those who, who serve our communities, our land, and also seek the honor of your name. We pray for every congregation of your people, every fellowship, every group that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would bless them. Um, we pray tomorrow for your day and that as people up and down the land meet, you would meet with them and all across the world and even as very soon Sunday will start in the, the east and as the day progresses all across the globe, your people meet. We pray that you would bless them wherever they are. We ask that as we gather here this evening that you would meet with us in, as we, we pray, as we sing your praise, as we read your word and as we reflect on it, that in all of these things that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us, that you would be working in our lives. And so we ask these things and we pray too that you would forgive all our sins, all our failures. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like us to read this evening from the Holy Bible, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and we're reading from verses, verse 40 to verse 56. So this takes place in the kind of early part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus in Galilee. And uh, in chapter 8, Jesus has been with his disciples. Um, they've, they've been on the eastern side of the Lake of Galilee, and now they've returned to the western shore. So we take up the reading in verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him, except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. 
May God bless to us that reading from his word. So we sing again to God's praise from the hymn, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. And again, if you're able, please stand uh, to sing. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to like us this evening to turn back to the passage that we read to, in uh, Luke chapter 8. So in this chapter, there are four miracles, one after the, the other, which demonstrate Jesus Christ's power and authority over, first of all, the great forces of nature in the calming of the storm miracle, and then his authority over evil spirits in the, the healing of, of legion, a man with a whole legion of demons. And then in the passage we read, his power, his authority over illness and uncleanness and over death. And so we're going to look at the, Jesus' authority over illness and cleanness and over death in this sort of intertwined uh, narrative of Jesus dealing with these two people. So the passage begins with the Lord arriving back on the western shore of the Lake of Galilee. And verse 40 tells us that a crowd welcomed him. They'd been expecting him to come over, back over. And among the crowd is Jairus, who is a synagogue leader. And he is desperate. His 12-year-old daughter is about to die. And he goes to Jesus and he pleads with him to come and heal her. And so Jesus goes with him. But progress is slow. There's a big crowd around him, pressing uh, in on him as Jesus makes his way along the road to Jairus' house. 
And also in the crowd is a woman who has suffered constant menstrual bleeding for the past 12 years. Now, this condition would have caused physical weakness and discomfort. And it also, in that society, made her ritually unclean. Of course, this was a Jewish society. That their life was governed by the, the Torah, the law that was given to Moses. And in that law, there were many rules about what made you unclean. And this comes from Leviticus chapter 15, where we're told that when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as the days just as in the days of her period. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean, as is her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean, as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean until evening. Now, it's maybe hard for us to kind of get a handle on that. It's kind of alien to our culture, our society. But that was very much just part of life in, uh, among the Jews, among the Israelites uh, at this time. And many other traditional societies have similar rules to do with cleanness and uncleanness. And I'm sure you've got the basic gist of that passage from Leviticus that uncleanness was contagious. If you touched it, it made you unclean. And so for this woman, it meant that she was basically kind of cut off and excluded from society the whole time. She had a constant duty to, to self-isolate. She was barred from taking part in any of the uh, festivals of, of Israel, going to, to the temple in Jerusalem, um, from taking part in any, so, so many aspects of, of Jewish worship. She was barred from all of that because of her constant uncleanness and being able, being unable to become ritually clean. And so she's also desperate. Uh, Mark, in his account, tells us that, of the, of the same event, tells us that she'd been to every doctor and healer in the area, but none of them had been able to help her. She'd spent all the money uh, on them, but she was still in the same condition. And she has heard about the Lord, about Jesus and the great miracles and healings that he performs. And so she decides to go and touch his clothes in order to be healed. And it's clear she doesn't want anyone to notice her. She's ashamed and embarrassed of her condition. And also at, at this moment, Jesus is, is, is dealing with a request from an important member of the local community, from a synagogue leader, someone who had status and standing in the community. How could she, a, a nobody, someone who was excluded, had been excluded for 12 years, make a claim on Jesus' time and attention? And surely a, a religious teacher like Jesus would not want contact with an unclean person like her. But in her desperation, she thinks, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She wants to just to get the healing with no fuss, no one noticing, no attention at all. And so she, she kind of pushes her way through the crowd, reaches Jesus and, and just touches his, his cloak, his robe. And, and immediately she is healed and she knows it. Now, according to the, the Torah, the law that was given to Moses, whatever an unclean person touched, that also became unclean. And so normally, Jesus would have become unclean by her touching him. But here, instead of the uncleanness flowing from the woman to Jesus, contact with Jesus makes the woman clean. From, from Jesus, there is a contagious holiness, a contagious cleanness. Jesus is so pure, so holy, that his touch makes the unclean clean. 
And I think for us today, we, we don't have those rituals. It's not part of our society, our culture, of our practice. But of course, there are different kinds of uncleanness. And we can feel that our lives are unclean by the things that we, we do and say, by the, the thoughts that we have. And we, sometimes we can feel that uncleanness, that we're polluted. And if we feel like that, and whether we feel like it or not, we, we are polluted by our sins. But the one who can help us, the one who can save us and rescue us from that is the Lord Jesus Christ. His touch makes the unclean clean. Well, Jesus turns to the crowd and asks, who touched me? And Peter objects that, you know, there's all these people pressing around you. How can you ask who touched you? Everyone's touching you. Everyone's brushing against you. But Jesus says, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. So he knows what's happened. And I think it's really interesting that Jesus knows that power has gone out from him. And that suggests some kind of a cost to Jesus in his healing ministry. And that, of course, is in, in keeping with his whole mission, his whole ministry. He came to serve and ultimately to give his life as a ransom for many. And so from Jesus Christ, blessing and healing and salvation come to others, but at great cost to Jesus himself. And ultimately that is true of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. Well, the woman sees that she, she can't just escape unnoticed. She's been found out. And so she comes and, and, and trembling falls at Jesus' feet. She's terrified. She's been exposed. And she just thinks, I'm, 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 I'm for it now. I'm just, I'm, I'm really in trouble. And so before all the people, she tells why she had touched the Lord, and how she had been instantly healed. And Jesus, instead of criticizing or condemning her, speaks to her words of reassurance and comfort and acceptance. He says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, we may wonder, why does Jesus expose her like this before this big crowd of people? Why does he sort of shine the spotlight on her when she just, you know, that's the last thing she wants. She wants the, the ground to swallow her up. Well, I think there's a number of reasons. First of all, that Jesus himself is due the honor for healing her. Now, some of the miracles that Jesus performed were just, you know, they were very obvious. You know, someone who's sitting there uh, a blind beggar who can't see, and Jesus heals them, and it's clear to everyone that a healing has taken place, or someone who is lame or paralyzed, and, and it's obvious. But this wasn't obvious to anyone other than the woman herself. And others can only know if she tells them, and she owes that to the Lord. But I think Jesus also exposes her for her own benefit. She wanted no one to know about her. She'd been excluded for the past 12 years and felt like a, a nobody, like someone who had no importance at all. But to Jesus, she is important, and he wants to meet her personally. And he addresses her as daughter, a word of, of kindness and gentleness and honor and love. And tonight, you may feel that you're not important, that you're not significant. You may feel that you're excluded at school or in the neighborhood or at work or in the family or, or wherever. But you do matter to Jesus Christ. You are important to him. And that is one of the great lessons that we learn from this, uh, this event here, that no matter how insignificant you feel, you are significant, you are important, you matter to Jesus Christ. But perhaps also Jesus is speaking for Jairus' benefit. Jairus is desperately concerned for the, 
emergency at home, his daughter is dying, and now there's, there's this excruciating delay. And it's as if Jesus is saying to Jairus, you are very naturally concerned for your beloved daughter in her condition, but this woman here, she is my daughter, and she is important to me, she matters to me. So that, of course, was a message to the woman herself, but also to Jairus about uh, his regard for her. But Jesus also wants her to know that it's through her faith in him that she was healed or saved. Some people think, and, and even today think, if only I could touch, some, touch something that was associated with Jesus, some relic, maybe his cloak or the Holy Grail or some bit of the cross or something that had contact with Jesus, if only I could touch that, that would give me great blessing and maybe healing. And yet Jesus, but Jesus wants her to know that it's not touching his robe, it's not the touch that matters, it's the faith that matters, her faith in him. Now, she has maybe a muddled faith, it's maybe kind of mixed with superstition about touching his robe, but Jesus accepts that muddled faith, he's not harsh and critical, but he just gently tells her that it's her faith in him that has healed her. Now, some of us, I don't, I don't know most of you, but some of us might be so concerned for doctrinal correctness that we would totally dismiss such muddled faith. Now, of course, sound doctrine is, is really important. And Jesus does gently correct her but sometimes we need to see the, the seed of faith in the midst of, of muddle and confusion. Often when people first are drawn to Christ, they don't have it all worked out. There's muddle, there's confusion, but we should look for the seed of faith in that. And today, too, it is faith in Jesus Christ that brings blessing and salvation for you and for me. Just one other point while we're on this. The word uh, translated heal, your faith has healed you in verse 48. The, the word is actually usually translated saved. It's the, the common Greek word for, for saved. Uh, same in verse 50 where Jesus uh, speaks to Jairus. Don't be afraid, only believe and she will be uh, she will be healed, or, um, yeah, healed. Th that also, it's the word saved. And I think that's significant because salvation is one of those big words in the Bible. And I don't just mean a long word, but a word that is really, you know, has so, it's so significant in the whole of the Bible. In fact, Jesus was named, um, you know, Joseph is told you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And here we see that in the Bible, salvation is holistic. That means it's for the whole person. Salvation isn't just for the, the soul or for the mind, it is also for the body. Now, for most of us, if we are believers in Christ, that this aspect of salvation, this physical bodily aspect of salvation, will take place at the resurrection when Jesus Christ returns to this earth in the future. And on that day, our bodies will be raised, raised to life. And they will be healed of all that afflicts us now. I don't know what sort of health you have, whether you have good health or poor health. But of course, all of us are getting older and we're, uh, we slow down, we decay. And eventually we have the prospect of death. And the great hope of the Bible, that the Bible tells us of, is that one day that will go into reverse. One day there will be this total healing, healing of our bodies. And our bodies, if we have died before Christ returns, will be raised and raised to eternal, to eternal everlasting and healthy and uh, wholesome life. So 
Jesus Christ will transform these bodies into immortal bodies. And this miracle, like all of Jesus' miracles, is like an advanced foretaste, uh, a trailer of that great future, that great future hope of the healing that will take place at the resurrection. And it shows us that the healing, that the salvation that Jesus Christ brings is a total healing. It's a healing of the whole person. A few years ago, our family were getting the 7 a.m. train from Glasgow to London. And we had to get the taxi, a taxi from our home to uh, Glasgow Queen Street Station. And none of us are at our best early in the morning. And we were just a wee bit late leaving the house. Uh, but we still had enough time, but we were a bit worried. So we're in the taxi when we're driving towards the station, and then a few streets away from the station, we got stuck in traffic. And we waited there, we were sitting there, and the, the seconds were, were ticking by, and 7 a.m. came, and we thought we've probably missed it, but our only hope now is if the train is late leaving. Well, then the, the traffic cleared, we, we were dropped off at the station just a minute or two after seven, and we ran out of the car, ran onto the platform, just to see the train pulling away. We were too late, we'd missed it. And something like this happened to Jairus, the synagogue leader, except that it was way, way more serious than missing a train. His 12-year-old daughter was seriously ill and about to die. And he'd gone to Jesus in desperation and pleaded with him to come and heal her. And Jesus had set off with him back to his house. But then there was this excruciating delay. This woman with this uh, illness uh, had come to, be, to Jesus to be healed by him, and Jesus just takes ages. You know, he could have just ignored, you know, given her the healing and carried on. But he stops and he talks to her, and all the time he's, he's aware of his daughter's life ebbing away. And Jairus is now panicking. His daughter's dying. Every second counts. Surely Jesus could heal this woman later. She'd been like this for 12 years. What, what difference would a few more hours make? Has Jesus got no sense of triage? And then his panic turns to despair when a messenger arrives from the house with the news that his daughter has died. And he tells Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. It's too late now. The messenger from the house, his message is very abrupt, which may suggest that he didn't really approve of Jairus going to Jesus. And this messenger thinks, well, even if Jesus were able to heal people, there's nothing he can do now because the girl is dead. It's too late. But he's making a big mistake. He is underestimating the Lord Jesus. And Jesus hears this, hears the messenger, what he says to Jairus. And he says to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be saved. And Jesus Christ is saying this in a situation of, of death. And if he can say this in a situation of death, then there is absolutely no situation that is too difficult for him to deal with. And you may be experiencing trouble in your life, maybe, maybe disaster even, or some catastrophe has happened in your life. Maybe you're ill. Maybe you have some turmoil in your family. Or maybe you're facing some big change in your life and you've got some massive decision to make that has you know, repercussions for the rest of your life and you, just, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know which way to go, you're confused. Or maybe you're worried about money, you can't make ends meet, the, the money runs out before the, the month does. Or maybe you're worried about 
loss of reputation. Or maybe you feel guilt and shame and even uncleanness about your life or about something in particular. Maybe some word that you just wish could be unsaid or something that you've done and you just wish you could turn the clock back and undo it. Or maybe you fear death and you fear what lies beyond death. Well, Jesus' words to you in that situation are the same as his words to Jairus. Don't be afraid, just believe. Believe in me, trust in me, put your confidence in me. And he may not answer your prayer, your desire, in the way that you expect or want. But he will work out everything for your ultimate good if you trust him. Well, they arrive finally at Jairus' house and Jesus sends everyone out and just takes in the girl's parents and three disciples. And I think it's just fascinating to contrast the way he deals with Jairus' daughter from the way he deals with the, the woman earlier. With the woman, he exposes her to the, to the whole crowd. Whereas in this situation, it's privacy that is, is the key. And that's for the girl's benefit. You know, she, he doesn't want her to awake to a room of excited people. And so we see Jesus' compassion and care, even in the details. So in verse 54, Jesus goes in and he takes hold of her by the hand and says, Child, get up. Now again, according to the, the Torah, the law of Moses, contact with a, with a corpse, with a dead body, made a person unclean. But instead of that happening, again, it is life that flows from Jesus to the dead girl. Her spirit returns to her and immediately she gets up. And Jairus and his wife receive back their beloved daughter from the dead. Jesus tells them to give her something to eat. Her parents are amazed, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now, the fact that this girl who was dead was now alive couldn't be hidden. Of course, the mourners had come. They knew she was dead. But Jesus' aim is just to make this as easy as possible for the girl and her family to avoid the sensation in the community to avoid the first century equivalent of social media and the tabloid press getting hold of it and making you know, a, just a big issue of this. He wants it just to be as calm and quiet as possible for them. Uh, and, and again, just we, we see the, the compassion of Jesus even seeing to these details in this situation. But Jesus here demonstrates that he has authority and power over illness and over death. And that is good news. It's good news for us if we're ill, if we're sick, if we're disabled, or if we're just feeling our age and the process of decay. And the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ is forgiveness, it's healing, it's cleansing, it's renewal, and it's resurrection. Don't miss out on that. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not a disciple, if you're not a believer, this is what you're, you're missing out on. Don't miss out on that. Come to Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. Trust him. Commit your life into his hands. But just to, to sort of wrap this up, according to the Bible, our sins make us unclean and result in death. The wages of sin is death, as the Bible says. Our uncleanness means that we're not fit to be in the presence of a pure and holy God. It cuts us off from Him. And death, both physical and spiritual, is the just punishment for our sins. But here we see the Lord Jesus dealing with both of these. He takes away uncleanness and it puts death into reverse. And he can do that for us today if we come to him in faith. 
And that is possible ultimately because of his own death. His sacrifice purifies us from all uncleanness. His death is in our place for our sins. He dies so that we need not die eternally. And God demonstrated his approval of Jesus and his sacrifice by raising him from the dead. And it's this that we're going to remember and, and celebrate tomorrow morning as we take the communion. But how can we receive today blessing and healing and salvation from Jesus Christ? What do we need to bring to him to gain these things? Well, all the woman and all Jairus had was their need and a basic trust that Jesus could help them. And all that we need to bring is our need and to trust him with our lives, with our situations. May God bless to us his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel and how it presents the Lord Jesus to us. And we see just the, the wonder and the beauty, the, the awesomeness of his power and his compassion. And we praise you for that. Lord, we thank you that you are such a, a savior, such a king, such a Lord. And we pray that we may trust you, whatever our situation is this evening, whether our times are good or bad. Lord, you know us, and we pray that we would entrust our lives, our whole situation, into your hands and know the, the peace that that can bring to us. So bless us, be with us as we go our separate ways. Continue with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we close our service this evening singing from Psalm 16. I'll praise the Lord my God. This May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.